Good morning, my name is Tatiana Barreto Vélez and I come from the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras campus. And I was mentored by Dr. Cynthia Hayo this summer and the question that we studied was, does the yellowing of the Gulf of Maine by humic acid inputs interfere with organic phosphorus utilization by the toxic dinoflagellate Alexander Fundiensi? So during the summer months, the Gulf of Maine experiences algal blooms of the toxic dinoflagellate Alexanderium fundiensi, and these are harmful as they produce toxins, specifically saxitoxin, which shellfish bioaccumulate. Um, so even though these blooms aren't as dense as blooms of other species, they, the densities of 100 to 200 cells could um, contaminate shellfish and as a result of consuming contaminated shellfish people may experience paralytic shellfish poisoning. These blooms originate from cyst beds in the Bay of Fundy and the Casco Bay and they are transported through currents along the coast to the Gulf of Maine, Massachusetts Bay and Cape Cod. The northern part of this population all the way to Massachusetts Bay is a pure Alexandrum fundiensi population and Cape Cod southward is um, a mixture of Alexandrium fundiensi and Alexandrium tamarensi. So through their transport along the coast, Alexandrium fundiensi is exposed to rivering inputs of nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus. Alexandrium fundiensi has the ability to utilize both inorganic and organic phosphorus. It takes up inorganic phosphorus directly, however, it can't do the same with dissolved organic phosphorus. So it synthesizes the alkaline phosphatase enzyme at its cell surface in order to cleave the DOP molecule into carbon and phosphorus, making phosphorus available for uptake by the cell. However, nutrients aren't the only rivering input these cells are exposed to. Dr. Balch and his colleagues have studied what they call the yellowing of the Gulf of Maine in the past century, which they attribute to an intensification of the hydrological cycle and river runoffs. However, the yellow color in itself is caused by dissolved humic substances, which are basically the products of degraded organic matter in soil and sediments. So they hypothesize that these cells could potentially um, be shaded by the humics, thus inhibiting photosynthesis. However, it's been studied in freshwater systems that these humics could potentially be forming a complex with the cell, thus with the enzyme, sorry, inhibiting the enzyme from cleaving the dissolved organic phosphorus molecule. So we had four hypotheses. First, that the humics interfere with the functioning of the alkaline phosphatase enzyme in Alexandrum fundiensi. Second, that the effects of the humic additions on the enzyme varies with concentration of humics. Third, that APA repression in Alexandrum fundiensi is greatest under high molecular weight fractions of humics. And fourth, that APA repression varies with humic source. So we went over to the Kennebec River in Augusta by the Old Fort Western and collected 20 liters of humic water, which we acidified to a pH of two here at the lab and passed through an X88 resin column, which basically means that yellow humic water goes in and filtered clear water comes out. Thus, the humic molecules are attached to the resin in the column. Later on, we eluded the column um, to, with base, which gave us this element of concentrated humic substances. And we acidified to a pH of one, which resulted in the humic acids precipitating and the fulvic acids remaining in solution. Our dissolved humic substances used for this experiment were a combination of both. And we finished drying them with a rotovap and an oven. We obtained a clone from the NCMA of Alexandrum fundiensi, which we grew under a 1SI media, and these are my happy and healthy cells. For our experiments, since alkaline phosphatase activity is repressed under high inorganic phosphorus concentrations, our cultures were P-stressed by eliminating the phosphorus source in the media, and later on we in order to activate alkaline phosphatase activity, which we measured fluorometrically according to Ammerman. 
Um, the, method, the substrate that we used was for methylumbelloferal phosphate, which is composed of um, methylumbelloferone attached to a phosphorus molecule. When MOFP, it's in its whole, it's not fluorescent. Um, so when the alkaline phosphatase enzyme cleaves the phosphorus away, MOF becomes fluorescent, and an increase in fluorescence is indicative of an increase in alkaline phosphatase activity. And we measured um, alkaline phosphatase activity under four different experiments with different um, humic treatments. For our first, first hypothesis, where we were testing whether the humics did repress alkaline phosphatase activity in Alexandrum fundiensi, we applied two treatments a control of no additions of humics and a Kennebec River elevated concentration of five milligrams per liter. Our results show that repression under humic treatments um, was of about two thirds, which could indicate that the humics are binding to the enzyme at its cell surface. For our second experiment, where we wanted to see if this effect of the humics was different with concentration. We applied four treatments, a control of no addition, a typical concentration of the gulf of two milligrams per liter, and elevated concentrations of five and 15 milligrams per liter. Um, I present to you this graph in percent change in APA from the control. And what we observed was that after five milligrams per liter, the repression in APA plateaued which could mean that the enzyme has become saturated at these higher concentrations. For our third hypothesis, where we wanted to see if repression of APA varied with um, different humic molecular weights, we applied four treatments, a control of no additions, a less than 10,000, a 10,000 to 100,000, and a greater than 100,000 molecular weight. Under the lower molecular weight fractions, we observed greater variability. Um, however, the greatest repression in APA was observed in the highest molecular weight fraction of greater than 100,000. For our final um, experiment, we wanted to see if this effect of the humics varied with humic source. So we applied five different treatments, um, a control, Kennebec River humics, which are from a highly forested watershed and three different, chemically different um, humics from Florida. Um, so what we observed was a great um, variability in repression. However, the greatest repression was with the environmentally relevant humics um, here from the Kennebec River. So from our experiments, we can conclude that DHS additions to Alexandrium fundiensi repressed alkaline phosphatase activity, which we hypothesized was by interacting with the cell surface enzyme. We also observed this with, sorry, with increasing DHS concentrations, higher molecular weight fractions of humics, and environmentally relevant humics. With future climate change, such as increasing concentrations of humics, higher temperatures, and intensification of the hydrological cycle and river runoffs, we can predict that there will be changes in the cisbets dynamics in the Bay of Fundy and the Casco Bay. Um, under higher temperatures and cisment time would change, which would um, change the time the bloom um, runs through the coast, and thus changing its nutrient availability. With increasing concentrations of humics, uh, Alexander Fundiensi could potentially become phosphorus limited. And um, taking all that, toxic algal bloom dynamics in the Gulf of Maine could potentially change. So for my acknowledgments, I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Cynthia Heil, and all the other scientists um, who provided their expertise and equipment um, in order to perform our experiments. I'd also like to thank the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences, the National Science Foundation, and the University of Puerto Rico. Thank you.
Is it working? Oh, it's weird. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Abby Onis. I go to Smith College, but I'm originally from South Portland, Maine. And my mentor this summer was Dr. Barney Balch. And the project I worked on was Mixotrophy in the Coccolithophores, Pleurocrisis, and Emiliania. And just kind of preface all of this, this is a picture right here of a coccolithophore at two microns, and they can make these hugely dense blooms that can be seen from outer space, which is the picture of my background. So coccolithophores are single-celled eukaryotic phytoplankton, which means that they're primary producers and they undergo photosynthesis. They're also really important calcifiers, and they make these calcium carbonate shells called um, coccoliths, and this is a picture of them right here. And basically, through primary production and calcification, they have a really important role in cycling of carbon, specifically in the biological carbon pump and the alkalinity pump, both of which have to do with movement of carbon, both organic and inorganic, from the surface of the ocean to the depths. Well, there's been some evidence through time that coccolithophores could actually be mixotrophic. And what I mean by mixotrophy here is really just the combination of phototrophy and heterotrophy. So to kind of reiterate what this looks like is you have your phototrophs over here, which are traditionally seen as the primary producers, and then you have your heterotrophs over here, which consume other organisms for their carbon sources for energy, and then you have the mixotrophs in the middle, which are able to combine both um, phototrophy and heterotrophy. And so why do we really care about mixotrophy? Well, for coccolithophores specifically, it kind of complicates the way we think about trophic dynamics, because now we're talking about primary producers, which are at the bottom of the food web, that are also consumers, which is interesting. Um, it could also alter the way we think about the alkalinity pump. Traditionally, it's thought that PIC, or the calcium carbonate in their coccolis, primarily comes from DIC, or inorganic carbon, but if they're mixotrophic, it's possible that this could also come from DOC, or organic carbon. And there's kind of some evidence, um, for theoretical evidence of mixotrophy in coccolithophores, but first looking back on evolutionary history through the KT boundary and the extinction event, it was a period of about three months of darkness, so you can imagine that all the organisms that had to survive this time had to have a way of obtaining carbon through some way other than photosynthesis. Um, and coccolithophores also have this physical characteristic called the haptonema, it's a picture right here, which is an organelle that can possibly be used to catch particles um, to prey on. And there has been other previous studies that studied phytoplankton um, in the dark, which did indicate growth on different organics, specifically on glycerol. But there's never really been widespread testing of a bunch of different organic carbon compounds, and that's mostly due to technological constraints. There's never really been an easy way to test this out, that is, until now which we have these great tools called the Biolog Ecoplates. And basically what they are is that they're microplates, and they have 31 different organic carbon compounds in them. And these compounds are supposed to be what you would find in the natural environment. Um, also, within each well is a tetrazoleum dye, which turns a violet color in relation to the oxidation of the compound. So this way, you can measure the absorbance in these plates as a proxy for metabolism of a compound. However, going into this, there is a known issue with the calcium ion in these plates in that it produces a false positive effect on absorbance readings due to this undissolved material. So that is something that you have to keep in mind when working with marine organisms because calcium is something that you find in seawater. So going into this project, we had two goals. The first was to determine the effect of calcium on false positives in biologic ecoplates. And then after that, our second goal was to determine, to determine which compounds can be oxidized by coccolithophores as evidence of mixotrophy, and if there's a difference between the strains that we tested. So I started off with five variations of calcium in artificial seawater media. And I, the largest concentration was 10 millimolar up here, which is what you would find in full strength seawater in the natural environment. And then I ranged all the way down to zero, zero millimolar calcium, which is a complete absence of calcium. And I basically took these medias, inoculated the plates, and let them sit for 24 hours, and then measured their absorbance on a spectrophotometer. And these are some of the results that I got. So with the, the x-axis here is time in days, so over a period of five days, and then the y-axis is my absorbance. And as you can tell, 10 millimolar is up on the top, so it had an immediate and lasting false positive effect. Even 7.5 and 5 millimolar calcium 
in artificial seawater also had false positive effects, but to a lesser extent. And the highest concentration of calcium that I could get in artificial seawater without a false positive effect was my 2.5 millimolar, which you can see right down here. <laughs> and so from there, I moved on to working with the coccolithophores. And I grew up azenic cultures of Emiliania huxleyi and Pleurocrisis carteri, which are pictures of these organisms right here. And through their growth cycles, I drew them out at, during exponential growth phase. And I centrifuged them, and I resuspended them in 2.5 millimolar calcium seawater. And then I inoculated the biolog ecoplates with them, and I placed them in the dark and read the absorbance after 24 hours. And the key here was being that I incubated them in the dark because I didn't want any photosynthesis happening. I wanted all the oxidation to be the result of heterotrophic activity. And these are kind of what some of my results look like. So you have pleurocrisis over here, and you have EHEX over here, and this is after 24 hours in the dark. And the x-axis is all of my different carbon compounds, and the y-axis is absorbance. So as you can tell, with the asterisk, there's a significant difference. So for a lot of these compounds, it seems that pleurocrisis had more compounds that were significantly different than EHEX, and they also had higher absorbances. But for both, there was a really highly significant um, result in idaconic acid, which is this bar right here. And that showed up in every single replicate that I had for both species. It wasn't species dependent. And with all my replicates, I pulled the data together to see what I found. And pleurocrisis is over here, and EHUX is over here. And you can tell that pleurocrisis oxidized a total of 17 of the 31 compounds and EHUX oxidized a total of 13 of the 31. And for both, idaconic acid was the most frequently oxidized compound. So of course, I had a lot of questions looking at the results. The first being, what exactly is idaconic acid and what could it be used for, these coccolithophores? Well, I couldn't really answer that question, but I found a picture of the structure here. And all we know is that it's a naturally produced compound by Aspergillus, which is a fungus. And uh, it's produced through fermentation. But as far as what coccolithophores could be using this for, for a carbon source, I don't really know. That would be an interesting direction to go forward in the future. The next question I had was, why was there this different scene between pleurocrisis and E. huxleyi? And I thought it might come down to adaptation to environment. So pleurocrisis is traditionally an estuarine species, meaning that it grows in an area with high organic availability versus E. huxleyi, which is more of a cosmopolitan, ubiquitous species. So it would make sense that pleurocrisis might be better adapted to using organic compounds, at least within 24 hours of contact. And the last question I had really was, what was the extent of heterotrophy in my experiments? And how did this compare to what we would find in the ocean? And to think about this, I really purposely starved my cells in my experiment. I did not give them any light, so I forced them to rely on the compounds and the plates. And I'm not exactly sure if this is what would reflect what happens in the natural ocean unless there was some type of catastrophic darkness event. But um, I think in the ocean, the extent of heterotrophy and mixotrophic organisms really is dependent on a lot of factors, one being light availability, which can be seasonal, um, also dependent on the location of the water column, that these cells have coccolis, which are really heavy, and that means that the cells want to sink over time, so they'll sink out of the euphotic zone, and when that happens, you can imagine they need some other form of carbon to survive on. And I think it can also be dependent on life stage, whether the organisms are modal or not. And so to conclude all of my findings, um, we did find evidence of mixotrophy in coccolithophores through the oxidation of several different organic carbon compounds, which means that mixotrophy may actually be more common than we think, at least in coccolithophores, which is cool. Um, but as far as future studies, there's a lot of directions you can go in. You could look at the mechanisms of uptake of these compounds, also the rate of uptake of these compounds, and what metabolic pathways that they're used for. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge the Bigelow RU program and Barney, of course, and everyone else in the Balch Lab. And thank you to the Emerson Lab for letting me use your spec and to David and the NSF. Thanks.
So her question was, ooh, sorry, ooh. Um, is it basically what type of controls did I have? So when I put the cells in the plate, I didn't, I didn't have, all my cultures were grown the same. So I put all the cells in the plate and then I starved all of them from light at least for the 24 hours. So it wasn't like I had a plate with light and one without. Just comparing, I just kept them all from the light. <laughs> I think there definitely could be. When I talked about the KT boundary, um, it definitely, I think, if any organisms were going to survive that, they would have had to have been mixotrophic or, or in some way. And I think, I think, yeah, that could be an ad advantage. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I'm not sure if it's all members of the genus um, that produce it, but I don't think it's a marine species, no. But, yeah, I don't actually know if that would be something interesting to look at. Yes? I was just curious. I think this is a mixed study. And one thing with APEC, uh, they have different types of forms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely been a couple studies. I'm not sure on these organisms, but on other types of cockleophores that have looked at the difference between life stages. And I think the, yeah, they found that the modal haploid stage, I think, was the, the mixotrophic one, because um, it's more adapted to oligotrophic conditions or more commonly found there. But yeah, it's definitely dependent on that, too, I think. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? <laughs> 